Good afternoon. Uh, hopefully, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, we're having some issues here with with teams um, across the pond. Uh, nevertheless, we're just going to get things underway here. Kind of an exciting, um, exciting symposium. We're doing a little bit of a, a different um, format this year, uh, given the fact that uh, Mr. Constantini uh, was unable to travel at this time due to their their schedule. Uh, but right now um, they're having some issue with with teams. But we're going to get things underway here, and I'm going to go through the the format of this afternoon. Um, uh, again, I said my name is Jason Lorenzo. I'm the assistant professor here of aeronautics at Kent State University. I'm also the UAS lead. We also have um, we also have um, um, a panel that's going to be discussing uh, um, going to be discussing uh, the talk of Mr. Constantini and Mr. Uh, Ballerano afterwards. Uh, that that uh, panel will be made up of uh, Joe Zeese, who is the advisor to the um, governor on aeronautics and aerospace. We also have Tim Ravitch, uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, from the Florida Bar, and here's uh, uh, Lieutenant C or Colonel Joe Zeese with us. Um, and then uh, Tim Ravitch, who's uh, also a professor of aeronautics. At the University of Central Florida, and he's also a senior attorney uh, in a law firm in Chicago. Uh, Chris Pazella will also be with us, another attorney pilot, and as well as Dr. Uh, Shihab Syed uh, from here at Kent State, who's working on uh, a lot of interesting uh, projects involving drones. But um, as we're still working through the technical issue, um, trying to get uh, Rome back on with us, uh, there was a huge reason in our now fifth or sixth year of doing drone innovation that I really wanted uh, Mr. Constantini and his team to present to us. Is of course what is happening in Europe right now, especially in Italy. And they're going to give us, uh, I won't uh, really say too much about the presentation, but I think you'll, you'll find it interesting on European airspace and, and really how much quicker they can get a few things done. But Mr. Constantini is an Italian attorney, an Italian lawyer, practices transportation in aviation law uh, since 1997. He was director of legal and legislative uh, department of trade associations in the tourism sector. And he's been a partner in uh, different law firms throughout Italy, uh, but especially now he's with um, Pellerini and Associates in Rome. I had a chance to visit him and uh, Laura Pellerini uh, last year, and it's a, a very, uh, very nice area of Rome where the, where the law firm is. But Mr. Constantini has also participated in several uh, consultation committees and groups established by the Italian government, public entities, and of course, the European Union Commission. He's been a member of the Board of Directors, the European Travel Agencies and Tour Operators Association uh, with an office in Brussels. And from 2019, he's chairman of the Italian Helicopter Association, which I think is a really good uh, segue into uh, uh, remotely piloted aircraft systems and main trade association of the helicopter companies operating in the emergency medical services, firefighting services, and especially in helicopter transportation. He's a member of the Board of Governors of the European Helicopter Association, the European Association um, whose members are national organizations of helicopter operators. And from March of 20, 2021, Mr. Constantini is of counsel at Studio Legal Perlini, focusing his practice on aviation and transportation law, and he provides uh, inf uh, advice to clients across the whole uh, barrage of international transportation and tourism sector, including antitrust and regulatory advice, litigation and dispute resolution, of course, corporate issues. Um, Francisco Paolo Ballerano uh, has really broad experience in aviation law and uh, with specific reference to remotely piloted aircraft systems. I think that's a really interesting thing we're gonna talk about, especially with the panels, we call it unmanned, uncrewed, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, different uh, nomenclature that's used in Europe uh, based on ICAO. But more importantly, Mr. Ballerano 
is advising clients on authorization and certification before what's called ENAC, which is the Italian Civil Aviation Authority, and um, for specialized operations with remotely piloted aircraft systems, as well as um, uh, working on contracts for use of drones with particular regards to civil liability, insurance profiles, privacy, and customer relations. He assists clients in litigation, arbitration, and dispute resolution with main focus on aviation, labor, health, and civil law. And he's uh, really contributing now to the Italian, national, and international drone specialized uh, in those operations. And he's a, a member of the scientific commi uh, committee of the journal uh, Drone Zine, and he's a regular attendee at conferences both in Italy and abroad. And hopefully, uh, they're telling me to keep vamping here. Um, one of the segues I'm going to do, on, I know Dr. Marla Perez Davis is with us. Uh, I'd like to introduce her just to briefly introduce herself. Uh, this this uh, drone innovation is part of a larger organization that was just established here at Kent State. On July 1st, we actually have an advanced air mobility center. And uh, uh, Dr. Perez Davis is actually our first director and um, uh, which is an honor to be serving with her in that capacity. And Dr. Perez, are you able to say a couple words and introduce yourself? Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Good morning to some of you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Jason, for putting this together. I know that the uh, organization and all the uh, the work that's behind the scene is uh, quite substantial. Uh, same thing for every one of the staff that supported the uh, the event. Uh, to the speaker, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among all of you. In uh, very exciting times, I think you know one of the things about advanced air mobility and everything that is going on in terms of the uh, aviation industry is about challenges and opportunities. And with challenges of opportunities come also the uh, the responsibility to make sure that we understand in the environment that we're working on and uh, what best at a conference and the topics that are going to be you know discussed today so i'm looking uh, forward to the discussion today um it's a great honor to be serving as the first director for the uh, center for advanced air mobility and i'm looking forward to great things to come so jason thank you so much for your time thank you for everything that you're doing toward the uh um goals and objectives of the center. Thank you. And and thank you, Marla. I know we're still having a little bit of technical issue, so I'm going to go around and introduce the panel. And if you want to say a few words, uh, Joe Zeese, I know you're with us. I see you on. If you'd like to introduce yourself and thank you for joining us. I know you had a couple of uh, uh, meetings this morning, so thank you uh, from the uh, uh, for taking time out uh, from, from the governor's office to be with us this afternoon, especially now as we're working through these technical issues. But Joe, welcome and thank you. Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Now it's a pleasure uh, and an honor to be here. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, this is a critically important sector of the aerospace and defense environment in, uh, in Ohio. Um, number one, uh, clearly it's, uh, it's pathfinding. But uh, but also it's uh, it's important in terms of national security. It's important in terms of economic development for Ohio. You know, one of the uh, the governor's uh, key visions is that Ohio be on the leading edge of, uh, of aerospace development into the 21st century. And uh, so so clearly this is it. And whether we're talking about uncrewed vehicles. Um, drones, or whether we're talking about advanced air mobility concepts, which tends to bridge that gap, um, it's uh, it's fascinating to see the technological development, but also the regulatory as well as the uh, integration issues. And so, bringing together panels like this that can talk the legal, the regulatory, the ethical uh, pieces that go along with the technical that's uh, that's so important in the uh, in the merge there. So I look forward to our discussion both now as well as uh, uh, you know a little bit uh, you know later with the panel there uh, there Jason it's uh, it's it's very very uh, very interesting uh, and so thanks for the kind invitation to uh, to be here. Th thank you Joe again for taking time. Uh, I know we we do have some progress here. Um, we do understand that um, 
that uh, Lessio is on. We're just trying to go through some of these bugs right now, work these out. Uh, one of the, the hopes, uh, I know there's several attorneys on with us, is one of the hopes that um, we're going to be working through here is uh, in presenting and offering next year as a continuing legal education uh, seminar. Um, you know, day long, eight eight credit hours. So we wanted to use this format to um, to basically reach attorneys and and legal professionals, uh, not just in the United States but globally, with what we're doing with advanced air mobility here in Ohio. Uh, I see now that um, Dr. Shehab is with us, and uh, he's one of our professors here at Kent State, who's who's working in several different areas uh, with, with drones. And with UASs and and uh, Dr. Shehab, if you could just uh, introduce yourself and um, let us know what you're working on. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. So um, my name is uh, Soyot Shehab. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the College of Aeronautics and Engineering here at Kent State University. Um, I teach and research um, um, topics related to aviation and advanced air mobility. Um, today, um, I hope to touch uh, touch on a little bit on the importance of public-private partnerships um, for uh, the development of the required advanced air mobility infrastructure. Um, as well as uh, some projects uh, that I worked on alongside um, um, Professor Lorenzen here. And uh, so in a nutshell, uh, my research uh, focuses on optimizing advanced air mobility operations. And um, I look into uh, various problems uh, such as uh, how to prevent bird strikes uh, with aircraft, how to optimize the supply chain planning for AVTOL manufacturers, um, and so on. So very excited to be here and um, participate in the uh, ensuing discussion. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Shehab. Um, we're still faced here with a little bit of uh, technical difficulties here. Um, hopefully we get some some update here. Uh, uh, again, they're about six hours. Actually, there are six hours ahead of us in in Rome, and um, we're getting updates that they are on, but uh, somehow we can't get them to share the screen. But nevertheless, we'll still um, we'll still go ahead here, and we might do this a little bit backwards just to to to, to fill some of the time. And I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Shehab and Joe, if you guys can come back on. And we can discuss some of the questions. Um, and, and Joe, if you'd like to share with us what, uh, what's happening in the governor's office and essentially what you do, uh, the, the wonderful work that you do for our state, and also to the state of um, uh, drone development here, especially with, um, with Joby's big announcement a few weeks ago. Right. Well, thanks, uh, Jason. So, um, so I do really four things for the governor, and it's really uh, aligned to uh, to his strategy. And we call them the four pillars. The first is preserve, protect, defend, and expand Ohio's federal installations. And that includes not only Ohio's active duty installations, right? Patterson Defense Supply Center, Columbus, as well as Joint Systems Manufacturing Center, Lima, the Lima tank plant by any other uh, name, but also uh, our reserve bases, including Youngstown Air Reserve Base, the uh, the Air National Guard and the the overall National Guard, third largest National Guard in the nation, the second largest Air Guard. Um, <clears throat> we use the word federal very specifically because it's not just those military assets that are Ohio, and by and large they're very very much focused on research, development, test, evaluation, and acquisition. So therefore, advanced aerospace technology fits firmly into that mission of our federal and military installations. But we also want to bring in NASA, right? Absolutely critical federal installation. You tend to think of this first pillar as the BRAC pillar, the base realignment closure pillar. pillar. 
it's beyond that. It's the expansion to all the federal installations in Ohio that deal in aerospace and defense. Clearly, NASA is one of our uh, one of our key partners. Clearly, they're highly integrated, as is uh, Air Force Research Laboratory, Air Force Life Cycle Management Center, into the research, development, and acquisition of uh, uncrewed systems into uh, into the military, uh, and and of course uh, our. Uh, uh, 178th wing at Springfield does command and control of uh, of drones and UAVs. NASA clearly, in terms of uh, airspace integration, technology development, control system development, is also large into uh, into of course uh, drones and advanced air mobility concepts. The other federal agency that comes under this first pillar is really the U.S. Coast Guard and the opportunity to develop, integrate, demonstrate uh, both UAV and advanced air mobility concepts in the search and rescue world of the ninth district of the US Coast Guard, who are the guardians of the Great Lakes. So everything from Station Buffalo all the way around to uh, through the Great Lakes, 6,000 uh, 6, people in the, uh, in the ninth Coast Guard district. So very, very, uh, very, very fascinating. Um, that's the first pillar. The second follows, and it's really based on the research and development work that's done at our installations. That's to increase the research synergies and portfolios of Ohio's national level laboratories. By that, I mean both the Air Force Research Laboratory, as well as NASA Glenn, both Lewis site, as well as Armstrong Test Facility in Sandusky, Ohio, um, underpinned by the Ohio Federal Research Network of our universities, which of course, Kent State, heavily engaged, heavily engaged in aerospace development and work on cutting edge technologies. Third pillar follows, and that is to uh, aggressively seek mission and uh, industry into Ohio, uh, working with our partners at Jobs Ohio. So that's uh, basically break those apart. Industry being, of course, our uh, commercial industrial partners uh, mission being our uh, military partners, because that's that's clearly economic uh, development in our economic interest. The fourth is what you think the, nat uh, you know, the natural follow on of all of these, and that's really to uh, seek to develop and support the workforce, both university educated as well as career tech center trained and the STEM STEAM pipeline to support pillars one, two and three above. Jason, you mentioned Joby. Uh, that's extraordinary. And clearly, uh, a lot of our focus in Ohio in advanced uh, aviation, advanced aircraft, and the applications, as well as, and I think we'll talk about the use studies that Ohio Department of Transportation is working, but we're wrapped up uh, completely in advanced air mobility, drone work, and things like that. Joby, of course, just announced a uh, production facility uh, at the Dayton Airport for, uh, for their aircraft. Uh, as well as work at Springfield at the National Center for Advanced Air Mobility. Uh, so uh, incredibly exciting to be part with Joby, as well as uh, as Beta with uh, with their demonstration Vertiport at Springfield. So it's incredibly engaging working with those uh, working with those folks. My job is really to look to integrate and how and look for ways where we can build partnerships that really uh, support uh, each one of the governor's pillars, but also support each one of our partners. So it's extensive relationship. It's woven in the very fabric of Ohio aviation from the very start. And you know, look forward to, uh, to the future here. So that's where, where I engage with on behalf of the governor. So it's uh, very, very fascinating. And for retired Air Force officer like myself in test and evaluation, and then I went to law school doing aviation attorney work. Very, very fascinating. It's a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, wonderful opportunities for uh, for Ohio and for our nation. So thanks there, Jason. Thank you, Joe. We're still working through some of these uh, technical issues here. We'll get this worked out here shortly. Um, Dr. Shihab. Uh, why don't you tell us what you've been working on, um, especially the, the the projects you and I have been involved in and some of the other things that are, are happening. Sure. Um, so one of the projects that uh, Professor Lorenzen and I um, worked on was uh, sponsored by the Ohio Department of Transportation. 
And this project involved looking into setting up uh, the required surveillance infrastructure um, for enabling these advanced air mobility operations. So as part of this project, we looked into uh, how to set up the surveillance network consisting of various sensors, such as uh, ADSB, um, remote ID, uh, radars, um, um, audio sensors, as well as visual sensors um, across um, the six major cities um, of Ohio. And um, 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 we also carried out a rigorous um, cost benefit analysis of uh, to justify investment um, in setting up uh, surveillance networks across um, the Ohio to be able to uh, monitor the airspace and allow these drones uh, and eVTOLs to operate safely uh, and efficiently. Um, <clears throat> uh, furthermore, um, we uh, looked into the advantages of using um, public-private partnership. Um, so while I uh, looked at it from an economic perspective, um, Professor Lorenzen looked at it from the legal standpoint. And um, our uh, we concluded that um, the pu uh, public-private partnerships um, would be key to um, key to gathering the required investment for um, these type of infrastructure, um, surveillance infrastructure, as well as um, other infrastructure such as vertiports, um, takeoff and landing sites, charging infrastructure, uh, and so on. So uh, these type of arrangements would be beneficial for both uh, the private entities um, who invest as well as um, um, the public, um, of course. And um, as part of this project, um, we also looked at um, some non-economic benefits of advanced air mobility. So many of you um, might have come across several market studies of advanced air mobility. For example, um, one such study by uh, Deloitte uh, projected that uh, the advanced air mobility market uh, could can potentially grow to uh, about 115 uh, billion US dollars by uh, uh, 2035 and create about um, 280,000 uh, high paying jobs um, in the US, which would account for about 8% of the entire aerospace and defense workforce um, by 2035. But we also looked at some <clears throat> non-economic benefits, um, as in benefits for the society and environment in terms of uh, travel time savings for passengers, uh, cost and time savings um, associated with package deliveries using drones, um, environmental benefits from uh, the reduction in um, carbon emissions, um, um, because of the use of these uh, drones and eVTOLs instead of ground vehicles um, for the transportation. Um, increased yields in agriculture, um, um, benefits uh, when it comes to livestock monitoring and agriculture monitoring and things like that. And we found that um, um, that advanced air mobility can uh, result in uh, billions of dollars of uh, worth of benefits, um, which are uh, non-economic in nature. And then, of course, there are uh, the economic benefits, like I mentioned, um, and the government would also be able to um, um, generate uh, additional income through the tax they collect from these operations. So uh, this is in a nutshell um, um, our uh, uh, the findings of our um, project um, on um, advanced air mobility surveillance infrastructure and its um, 
um, and the role that the public private partnership can play and um, the cost benefit analysis as well, um, a, a, which also includes the non-economic benefits of advanced term mobility. Thank you, Dr. Shehab, for that. And I'm just going to segue, you know, hopefully share my screen so that you can uh, um, see my slides. Um, hopefully you can see the uh, low UAS, low altitude. Let's hopefully get confirmation here. This was part of the um, part of the uh, project that Dr. Shehab and I were working on with uh, with uh, uh, Cal Analytics, who are actually really developing and doing a great job with developing our um, low level. Europe is calling it U space, and our low altitude uh, surveillance system. Uh, my responsibility, along with a couple other attorneys, was just to say, hey, what's the legislative roadmap and can we do this surveillance under this airspace space at 400 feet? Pilots, we know it as class golf airspace. Um, and then it was going to be a subscription service. And that was one of the um, the things that we were working on. But it was a very narrow project. And of course, you know, how do we fund this is a public private par partnership. And this will also be overseen by uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation. But what's really interesting, which came out uh, through this uh, one project, of course, my my talks with Alessio, um, and, and especially in Italy with what they're working on. And I don't want to steal their, their, their thunder when they come on. But I really took that idea from what's going on in Italy and, and more importantly, uh, or more recently, what's going to be happening in Paris with the um, with the uh, Olympics next year. And uh, there's going to be drones flying passengers around. And I said, why don't we stop talking about it and actually do this? And we are in the uh, initial um, developing our concept of operations of transporting students from campus to our airport and back. Again, it's an accessibility issue for our students. Uh, those of us, I'm also teach at the airport. It can go anywhere between a 15 minute and 34 minute um, drive from from campus to the airport, and it's really only a three mile distance. And um, you know, we can do this with a drone in about three minutes. So it saves on parking, saves on time, saves on scheduling for classes, makes things a little bit more accessible. And we have first. Uh, second, third phase. But what really came out of this, which is really interesting, is the um, you know possible routes. Again, uh, there is no definition of where private property ends. We kind of think we know where it is, but we don't. So one of the things that the students came up with was these different drone routes to the airport and back. I was following the roads under 400 feet. Those are public utility ways, public easements, things that uh, you know it's not crossing or traversing over. Um, uh, private property. And then we started to work with Collins Aerospace on developing what's UAS routes in this dark space theory. And this is actually taken from April 1st to the 7th earlier this year. And as you can see, uh, Cleveland Hopkins does not have as much traffic as Kent State University. Yes, we are a training institute. All those little dots that you see are aircraft uh, over the course of a week. And there's a, a, a lot more traffic. Uh, we have a heavy airspace. Now, this is what we're seeing looking down towards the ground. What we don't see is that 3D projection. And the next step of this project with Collins is to actually give us a map. We can actually just take two fingers, lift that up, and we get a 3D impression of what uh, what air or what airspace airplanes manned aircraft are taking what, re, re, what results is we're going to see a lot of dark space there's going to be a lot more dark space in the 3d model and those are going to be our future drone airways so that way there's not a conflict between uh, manned aircraft and unmanned traffic around kent state again these are our entry corridors and probably see kent is to the upper part of that uh, north south pattern um, 
in 0 2 and Akron Fulton to the south. And you can see Akron Canton even doesn't have as much traffic as us, but you can see some of the airspace in there. And this research is really important, especially for us in this area, to, to say, hey, this is where we can actually put a drone route that's one safe. And then also, too, we have the data to show the FAA, the regulatory body, that this is what we can do. And one of the big issues that I know uh, Joe and I have been working on is a technology that creates the law or law that creates the technology. Well, really, it's technology that pushes the law to where we need to go. And uh, this is where we're at. Uh, Again, this this is another model of that same area showing, you know, the biggest dark, darkest octagon there is where aircraft and that's actually the Kent State Airport where they actually touch the ground. So we obviously know that, you know, we're going to have some issues there flying aircraft around that area. Again, another bigger, a bigger model. Um, and one of the other ways, too, is to possible routes above 500 feet. Again, looking at deconfliction is this idea of following the, this is an instrument procedure uh, coming into uh, Kent State Airport. Uh, and the students actually came up. Uh, that's why I love working with students, developing the next uh, generation of uh, aviation professional. Um, they actually came up with this route from campus. Uh, we already know it's established by the FAA. We already know that we can do it. We already know our limits. Uh, and also, too, with coexistence of manned and uh, unmanned aircraft. Of course, I always tell this famous joke of uh, July 31st, 2022 is George Jetson's birthday. You can see uh, George Jetson uh, flying his family around. It kind of gives us a timeline if we always look towards um, if we look towards uh, science fiction and to, to to arts and literature and movies, and of course, in this case, cartoons, kind of gives us a timeline where we can probably see, you know, full autonomous vehicles in the airspace. So we're probably looking at about 2060, and we're still in the incipient stages of this. So kind of gives you an outline of what I'm working on here at Kent State, trying to develop what is called our, um, our so-called U-space. And hopefully I can get this back here. And we'll can I ask sharing. a quick question, Professor? Sure, Lorenzo. Dr. Okay. Sure, Dr. Shihab. So um, as these uh, drones and AVTOLs fly um, through the urban airspace um, over cities, um, it might be collecting um, um, data um, deliberately or um, just as part of its operation. Uh, through the sensors it is mm -hmm. equipped with, um, which could be cameras, microphones, or other sensors. So what type of regulations do we need to ensure um, data privacy, uh, anonymization, and de-identification? Um, yeah, so just uh, want to know your thoughts um, on this from the regulatory side. Yeah, and that's that's a really good question because a lot of people are afraid of, you know, it's not so much the drone or the the vehicle flying over, uh, or yeah, the actual drone itself. It's what data can be collected. Um, you know, again, invasions of privacy. I think is where we're going with this. But generally, you know, if it's like me walking in public, a person walking in public. Uh, an aircraft flying in the national airspace system is essentially in the public domain. So unlike um, air or not unlike aircraft, those things are subject to, um, you know, they're in the public, they're flying in the national airspace system, much like a car. Uh, they're going to be subject to those rules. The expectation of privacy, and this is where it's really interesting, um, the uh, the whole issue of private pro uh, private property, of course, in the United States, is a little bit different in Europe. Again, I don't want to steal the thunder away from um, from from Alessio Constantini, uh, but uh, in the United States, we have, of course, the the Fourth Right Amendment to privacy, and of course, private property is one of our 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 major values, right? Owning the um, owning our our house and having that private property issue. And those are the things that um, regulations will need to address that, you know, again, if you're going to do something in the public domain, um, that's going to be subject to being in the public. 
but what other data will that collect? And, um, you know, there's a bunch of case law on this issue, you know, as long as, you know, there, there's a famous, um, a famous case called Serralo, United States versus Serralo, uh, where the helicopter was collecting data of somebody growing marijuana plants in their backyard. And uh, the helicopter was actually in a legal position being in the national airspace system. The pilots were certified. Everything was done correctly. Uh, but the person on the ground didn't um, protect their interests, right? They didn't protect a privacy interest. And um, that was actually okay. That was not a violation of Fourth Amendment, this privacy issue. You know, maybe if they had covered it up with something or, or grown it on the side or right underneath their um, overhang. Uh, the other issue that's really interesting uh, that Joe brought up to my attention, and I love the name of this case, the Hogwarts case. Uh, and we see a whole bunch of these cases, even the Cosby case, the famous chicken case that all my students know, um, which is really interesting because um, the Hogwarts case was more of an issue of an administrative subpoena. And the facts are much more interesting than the, the, the legal holding of the case. Uh, it's it's a bunch of guys who were actually putting a gun uh, to go hunting in their in their on their private property in their backyard and doing target shooting. Uh, and the best part of this, I know, next week is is Thanksgiving, and um, next week um, uh, don't get this idea of using your drone with a flamethrower to cook a turkey. And that's what these guys were doing. But the court never got to where private property ends. They were just like saying, well, can you do this? Well, we're not going to answer that question. Our, our issue is something called an FAA administrative subpoena. Can they subpoena these part or can they subpoena the records for this particular uh, uh, drone operation or this particular vehicle that the that the Hogwarts were using on their property? But it never really got to that question of where private property ends. And we see a whole string site of cases and we're going to have to see. That's why we're going to be doing this. That's where technology will push the law. OK, and I think to answer your question, not not to be a, a lawyerly answer, um, Dr. Shehab, but it's going to be more of um, it all depends. Right. And we're going to have to see what facts and circumstances come up. Uh, but the one good thing is that Ohio, I can say unequivocally, is leading the way in, in a lot of different areas, and especially in, in law, policy, and legislation. I don't know, Joe, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, maybe a couple of points to add, Jason, because you uh, you're, you really expertly uh, describe both Sorallo, Cosby, and, and the Hogwarts. Um, what is uh, what is kind of fascinating, I think, is is and the outcome of that is that assertion of where public airspace starts and stops and does public airspace and the ability of the FAA to control and exert control extend down to the grass top because then it's truly into your backyard. The question ultimately, I think, then devolves to um, what kind of use cases can we develop that will actually um, that will actually garner public acceptance and uh, and public usage of these type of systems, right? So there's no longer a fear, but an acceptance. Um, and and I think it really part of it is by privacy rights as it extends to uh, to property. But the other one, uh, which is interesting, is as you know, you both rightly bring up is data. And uh, and what about sensor data? It may be direct access of the data, but usually it's indirect. At least in my experience, it's been what what kind of data is captured uh, collaterally to the operation, and then the real question ultimately is, how is it that data stored? How is it accessed? How long is it kept? And so, uh, say so, you know if if one generates policy that addresses what data is garnered, how that data is stored and protected, and how that data could be accessed by either governmental or non-governmental agencies, and how long it's kept. Because that'll give actually some degree, I think, of uh, a public acceptance to the data, uh, incidental data collection and the, uh, and the overflight. Um, but I think 
because Jason, you mentioned public private partnership, right? Um, and so you mentioned that as well. It, you know, it, it, at least in my mind, it's the ability to generate uh, high payoff, very low risk demonstrations of either advanced air mobility or drone systems operations. And if you can do that and get high payoff with very, very low risk use cases, then I think you start to address what, at least in my mind, are the uh, are the three challenges to integration. And, and that's uh, number one, clearly, public acceptance. Uh, number two, you have to address and, and say, exactly, there's a visceral reaction to a drone that carries cameras or data accessing devices, right? And if you can, if you can, quell that visceral reaction, then I think you can go a long way to not only just basic public acceptance, but avoid the visceral reaction. Then the third piece, which Jason, you know, the demonstration uh, going from the airport to uh, Kent State really goes to is beyond line of sight. If there's a regulatory barrier at all to commercial viability. It's ability to operate beyond line of sight with suitable sensors and uh, you know suitable uh, separations. If you can do those things in the context of a valuable use case that's low risk, then that's the key. And that's that's clearly where Ohio wants to wants to focus in those use cases, whether it's over the Great Lakes, whether it's a demonstration case in transportation, as Jason suggests, whether it's medical delivery use cases in uh, physician deprived areas like Appalachia, right? Uh, those are the, those are, I think are the, are the key items that ODOT is working under contract with, uh, with NASA in terms of use case development. Yeah. Now, I think you bring up a really good point, um, uh, Joe, about public acceptance. I know we're still in the panel section here. We're kind of, uh, jumped ahead here as we're, uh, dealing with this, uh, issue but what about the public acceptance of this how can we get more of the public behind this and a couple of weeks ago joe you and i were at oai i don't know if you were there when i asked the question i said how many of you would get on a drone with me right now we're going to be back from you know cleveland hopkins airport to kent state campus in about 15 20 minutes versus the hour car drive and only two of us put up our hands i was one of two um, so we're just not there publicly is, you know, how do we get there? Um, is it just because this technology is so new? Is it because we're going to be talking about electronic engines? Uh, you know, how do we get the public to go along with this? Because ultimately it's, you know, it has to be a commercially viable, um, enterprise. I think, uh, Jason, um, I, and uh, say, I'm sorry, I'll, oh, no, that's, that's fine. Really I, I think uh, it, it's flipped that around. This is the post-World War II dream, right, of intra and inner city aviation, right, access by air. And, and it is the realization of the Pan Am concept, right, the Pan Am building in downtown New York City, accessible to JFK and back. And if you can do those kind of things, then, and provide that kind of value, or maybe it's organ transplant, right? And you can gain public acceptance because there is a very demonstrable value that's there. And oh, by the way, the risk and the data, uh, you know, the data uh, acquisition, whether incidental or direct, is is minimized and is understood by all, right? Then I think you can maybe start getting uh, getting the public to not only to buy in, but to go, you know, I want to be a part of that. You know, I want to take advantage of what the opportunities that this dream that we had right in 1945 and on right that we this dream that we had is now coming to fruition so i'm sorry Ted, I, I i interrupted you sir no, no that's completely fine i just wanted to add to what both of you said um that um, some other factors which would influence public acceptance uh would potentially be um, of course, um, the safety uh, or the demonstration of um, the safety levels of these type of aircraft, um, showing that these are safer than ground vehicles. 
um, as well as affordability. Um, and uh, I think um, these two factors would be would play a big role in public acceptance. Um, and then other factors such as uh, noise and um, privacy um, um, would also um, have an impact on public acceptance. Um, I just wanted to ask um, another question um, related to this topic. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, do you uh, do you guys feel that we might need um, a separate airspace class just for um, AAM operations? Uh, absolutely, and this is uh, again. Thank you for everybody for your patience, and thank you, uh, Dr. Shihab and, and Joe, for vamping with me here till we get uh, uh, this technical glitch here worked out. But what I love about the European airspace, there's a couple things. Uh, one, I don't think um, following Roman law, uh, I was made quite aware last year in in Europe that uh, under Roman law, the airspace is considered. Uh, part of the, the common good, part of the public good. So the moment you walk out of your house, everybody owns that air. Because, you know, how much air do you own, right? Above your property. That's essentially our private property rights. The FAA will say they can regulate everything from the blades of grass up to the edge of space. I don't think that's entirely correct because you have the private property issue. We have states' rights issues. We have a whole bunch of of other preempt preempt uh, preemptory issues. But however, what I do like about Europe, and I use this um, I've used this uh, uh, term here, is something called U space, right? UAS, unmanned aircraft, uh, uh, and, and uh, that I think is what you're going to see develop. And again, us working, that we're working, uh, you and I, especially with a dark space theory that I'm calling this, to, to actually come up with that airspace. Or how do we integrate into, you know, we have class echo, class golf airspace right now. Class golf is going to be where um, the stuff we're working on with Cal Analytics here in Ohio, that's where FA has already said, we are not going to control it. It's uncontrolled airspace. It's up to uh, up to uh, uh, the state level and and private industry to figure out what we're going to do with that surveillance system. So I think we're going to start to see it base in there, and then we're going to be developing out um, as these vehicles become much more um, integrated in the national airspace system. Uh, and again, that deconfliction, I can see drone airways, uh, drone air routes being uh, probably termed that what Europe calls them as use space. Shihab, you bring up a really, really good question about about airspace, right? And and dedicated to drone operations, um, and and it's, I, I think it's fundamental fundamental to integration, but it's not one size fits all, at least in my mind, right? So so larger drones. So so if if you're a, a global hawk sized drone, right? I'm fully integrated into the airspace, right? If I am a, uh, uh, if I'm not, if I am a, uh, a, a much smaller, uh, you know, system, well, maybe I don't need my own dedicated airspace, right? If, if, if I'm something about this size, right, if you can see what I'm holding, I don't need dedicated airspace. But it's that little gray, it's that gray zone that sits in between that I think is, is, uh, is where we're really talking about. And that may be the moderate size. Uh, you know, classes of uh, uh, of UASs that actually may uh, you know perform some kind of of very very useful function, whether it's delivery, right, light delivery, last mile delivery, whether it's organ delivery, right, incredibly valuable, right. Those don't necessarily need their own airways or airspaces, but what they could use, right, or what what what's a a good let's say at least mental framework before we get into the regulatory and the legal framework mental framework is i don't expect to see a helicopter delivering you know uh, something from a uh, from a uh, one of the uh, one of the package deliverers i don't expect to see a helicopter at 30 feet i may see one of those and and that's all fine right um so the area where you can say you know 
just just intellectually, I don't expect to see full scale aircraft, right? Crude aircraft, you know, below this level, unless there's an issue. That's that's where I think maybe the you know the truth, you know, or solvency lies, right? If we can if we can approach it in, in that in that context. Now, there there will definitely be a gray zone where where it fits one fits on top of the other or with each other. But I think there's uh, there's some interesting uh, notional operations deconfliction piece parts that are uh, that are uh, uh, maybe instructional. I'm just going to welcome now we've got at least one technical glitch taken care of. My colleague Tim Ravitch, my esteemed colleague, we're both members of the Florida Bar. We have, uh, you know, Tim, you've been influential in my career. Um, you have the, uh, your your claim to fame is uh, definitely your uh, aviation law, introduction to aviation law textbook published several years ago. I remember you gave us a copy of that years ago. Um, at the Florida, one of the Florida Bar Aviation Law Committee meetings, which I still have, by the way, uh, along with your actual copy. And uh, he and I are uh, two out of 47 members who are board certified in aviation, um, aviation law through the Florida Bar. And um, he's a professor at University of Central Florida. And I know he's a, a published author and um, uh, uh, and, and Tim, one of the questions I have, because I know in one of your articles, you did put in there saying that the FAA thinks that they own the airspace from the blades of grass up. So is that true? Where did that come from? Sure, so first of all, gentlemen, good job. Um, I'll fly with you any day, uh, uh, Jason. This is a long air traffic control hold, but we're, yes. we're, you're doing it. Um, I think actually this has been a very substantive conversation, so nice to be in your orbit. Um, and thanks for the uh, opportunity. So uh, in 2014, I think it was 2014, which is ancient history in new spaces such as uh, drones and certainly AAM, uh, I had the opportunity to work as the principal investigator for the National Academies of Sciences on a report uh, with respect to uh, drones and their legal implications uh, at, near, over, around uh, airports. Uh, and as part of that, um, the Federal Aviation Administration was a panelist. In other words, they reviewed uh, our work. And uh, out of that work um, and unrelated to that work, uh, what uh, was becoming evident is that as the Federal Aviation Administration and the regulators tried to react, um, and they were in a reactive posture rather than in an anticipatory posture, uh, the FAA, uh, like I think many regulators, took a more assertive position relative to their jurisdictional uh, scope and said, well, gosh, you know, if the sky is going to go dark here with drones, um, while we figure out whether we're going to have rules or not, and this is before part 107, which we can talk about more, uh, the FAA did, I think, what regulators do, which is just sort of exercise its muscle uh, try to assert a, a more robust uh, jurisdiction than maybe it has, uh, but it was arguable. So I'm not picking on the on the FAA. They say, look, I mean, someone's got to police this. And the, the idea was that um, the phrase is out there. I don't know that I can attribute it to the FAA, but the phrase uh, above the grass, I started to hear at conferences and, and just around that the FAA said it's not just the case that we have jurisdiction uh, in the national airspace, which you've all discussed, versus in terms of the Cosby case, the Sorello case I heard you, Jason, talk about. Uh, the FAA said, now, you know, maybe it's unclear. And maybe I'll just take a second to, to add on that so that the case I always liked was actually from our Florida uh, jurisdiction, Jason. It was, uh, uh, I think it was um, the uh, Pasco County Sheriff knew, just knew that that guy was growing marijuana, uh, but they couldn't get a probable cause warrant uh, to uh, from the judge. So what they did is they took a helicopter and they flew over the greenhouse and uh, dummy, you got a hole in your in your roof. And so they looked down and based on that information, they said, we see them growing marijuana. Then they went back to the judge and got their probable cause warrant. And the idea there is that in that case, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, and, and you've made this point, they have a right to be there. Uh, that that um, that helicopter was in the national airspace system. 
and uh, what you see is is fair game. The point being is that there's a controversy, I suppose, as to where that national airspace now exists. Does it expire at 400 feet? Does it expire at 500 feet in terms of private property? Or as the FAA is arguing, and why wouldn't they, uh, if it flies, if it's a toaster and it has a propeller, uh, we have jurisdiction. But that, and I'll be quiet, that to, your, to everyone's point is where there's a fault line between um, where is appropriate for the government to regulate, and there is a role for the government here, no question about it, safety and security. Uh, but at the same time, where does that regulatory authority start to inhibit uh, private enterprise and new innovation? Uh, can I jump in and ask something real quick? Uh, or, uh, or Joe, do you want to go first? No, go, Shihab. Okay. No, so, uh, Professor Lorenz, and you were mentioning about the airspace um, 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 being a public one from the blade of the grass to all the way to space. Um, but um, in in home ownership, uh, I, uh, I I came across that um, when someone um, insures their house, they say that the person owns that house all the way from the center of the earth to the space. So doesn't this like contradict uh, this uh, concept of public airspace? Yeah, I, I, again, um, th this is that big question, right? Where does private property end? Where does states' rights begin? Where does the national airspace start? We kind of have an idea through the regulations, uh, through, the, through the United States Code, national airspace system over um, congested areas will start about a thousand feet above the ground level, 500 feet over uncongested. Of course, and we got to look towards case law to determine what's uncongested. It's usually like more than four houses and a quarter of a mile is congested. So we've got kind of that area. So the problem is we know that uncontrolled airspace, class golf, and there is a, a question uh, from, from one of our students, which is kind of interesting. Um, how does the UAS airspace will affect something like class golf airspace. Will it change the dimensions of that airspace? I don't think for, for FAA purposes it will. I think we're going to see an addition to. We're going to see drone airways. The problem is we, we have a, a whole set of cases where somebody's flying a drone way too low over the property and they bring out their shotgun. Well, we know that because of the Perker cases that that's an aircraft. You shoot down an aircraft, um, Tim or Joe, I think it's what, 25 years minimum in prison? Um, oh. You're looking at some time. It's criminal, right? It's a, it's a, it's under 18 USC. I forget what the actual, I think it's 18 or something uh, like that, but it, it's, 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 it's criminal. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's also in common law, under tort law, it's a trespass, right? If you're too low and you're flying maybe 15 feet above a person's rooftop, is that a trespass? Yeah. Well, and this is where this area of law now is starting to 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 um, uh, it's it may take hold, and we're probably going to be here at the foothills of the development of this. But again, we have to get to public acceptance. Is it publicly acceptable to have one of these things fly over, as Joe mentioned, with all these sensors on board collecting this data? You know, maybe you want that privacy issue. Maybe you have something that you don't want the public to know, you know, whatever you're growing um, in a greenhouse or whatever you're growing in the public or whatever you're doing. We have that, again, we value our privacy. And this is going to be the issue. And I think where the FAA wants to exert their jurisdiction, and I think they do have jurisdiction over an aircraft that's certified or registered with the FAA, it you know comes down on the ground regardless of where it is. That aircraft is registered with the FAA, and I think that's where they can they can come back in and say, "Look, at we have jurisdiction over the aircraft that crashed on your private property." But in in so far as going, we have jurisdiction over the blades of grass. That's why I think in under Roman law, you know, where where airspace is a common good, it's part of the public domain. I think there's a different issue there. Uh, and, and we're going to have to see how this 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 all unravels here in the next uh, decade or so. It, it's I, I just add Jason and Tim and uh, Shihab. Yeah, I mean, so so great points. Um, what I find what I find fascinating, and and certainly as a 
as a very general comment, the uh, the center Earth to the stars methodology. I mean that there's mineral rights that intrude on that. There's air rights that intrude on that. So that that's a pretty uh, pretty broad. Uh, kind of approach that I think has been really uh, superseded, you know, clearly in, in in a lot of areas of the law. But I find what's what's really interesting in this, you know, it's it, and it's been the the definition in um, you know in code of navigable airspace, right? And that's the minimum altitudes um, uh, of flight prescribed by regulations under the subparts to fly, right? Including takeoff and landing. Here's here's what I find is very interesting. So we live within within three miles of a uh, of an airport. So uh, the FAA rule, I can't fly a drone within three miles of an airport. So if I'm standing, if I'm standing in my driveway, can I can I hover this at eye level? Can I can I hover that you know below the level of my house? My neighbor's interpretation of that is no, Joe, you're breaking the law. And my neighbor's not an attorney, clearly. But 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 it is it is an interesting question because it extends to uh, to I think some of the language in Hogwarts, albeit that was an administrative subpoena language, said the that um, the FAA controls that airspace even amongst trees in the backyard, right? And the judge, the administrative law judge even said this may be an absurd conclusion. But given our legal you know, situation right now in terms of how many cases go actually to uh, to a written decision, right, in, in civil, in, in the civil world, 95 percent of them are, are uh, you know, uh, are either adjudicated or settled well before a written opinion. So there's no real opinions that are describing what previously described the Cosby situation or the Strallo situation. So it it leaves a void in at least in my mind in how tight the regulations are, uh, or what is the what is the true rational interpretation of the regulations versus the the absurd. So I think it, you know it's certainly fascinating, but um, but in terms of how one regulates, how one controls, there, there's a lot of open questions. Certainly, in privacy, property rights. But I think in regulatory extent as well. Joe, I might jump in here. It's interesting. We're talking so much about cases and judges or administrative uh, or people like administrative law judges who are they're reactive, right? I mean, it at some level, the problem here may is less about what courts are saying or interpreting than the absence of like clear regulatory guidance or legislation on the matter. And sometimes you see frustration uh, with Congress saying, FAA, we need rules by this certain uh, date. I, I tell you, as a lawyer, it's it's fascinating that I have clients who sometimes are starving for regulation. Usually they, they don't want <laughs> regulation. Here are industries where they're just saying, just tell us. Um, and in other industries and in emerging technologies, you see this too. I think Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook uh, spoke or testified a few years ago in, I think it was Ireland, uh, saying, please regulate us. <laughs> T tell us what you want us to do or not, and then we'll know how to, to behave. Different context. But it is interesting that uh, we talk so much about the case law where, where maybe what we want to see is more legislation on the matter uh, and more uh, clearly more regulations. There, there was an interesting case because, Jason, you mentioned in terms of uh, what's the penalties for shooting down an aircraft. There was a, a Boggs v. Meredith, if I remember correctly, from 2017, right? And so, uh, what the real what the case was about was trespass to chattels. It was filed by the person who owned the drone that got shot down, and the judge refused actually. And the and his defense was it was in the national airspace system, right? You can't shoot that shoot me down. And the judge refused to actually approach it as a definition of the national airspace system again leaving tim as you're talking about leaving that void where what's what's the regulation there and, and it and it leads to a you know the potential of a, a you know certainly a, a open interpretation scenario I, I, 
I don't want to stop this part of the conversation, but we think we have a solution to our <laughs> issue. I do have Alessio on. We're going to try this through uh, uh, phone technology, and I do have his slides. So we're going to try that, and I'm going to hand this over now um, to Alessio, and we are going to get started uh, this way. So hopefully it works. Um, and uh, Alessio, there we go. Yes, we can hear you. I Hopefully everybody online can hear you. Sorry for these uh, technical problems, but I don't know what was going wrong with this application. But however, we did it. Okay. And uh, thank you for your invitation. And thank you for giving us the opportunity of sharing with uh, our uh, uh, US colleagues, lawyers, professors, and students our experience with drones. Um, we are a law firm specialized in aviation law. With me is uh, my um, colleague Francesco Ballerano, who works uh, together with me on specifically on the drone um, business, which is uh, really increasing also in Europe and not only in the US. We are having uh, exciting developments in this uh, industry, and of course. Uh, uh, this uh, calls also for uh, attention and uh, dedication by, by the lawyers because the legal implications are pretty uh, interesting and exciting. I wanted to commence our uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you can go with the next slide, just uh, showing you a couple of uh, uh, innovative uh, um, uh, uh, operations of drones. Uh, are you going uh, ahead with the slides, um, Jason? Yes. Yes, we're currently we're currently going going through the slide. Perfect. So I wanted to just to highlight a couple of uh, innovative uh, uh, commercial uh, operations of uh, drones. The first one is drone delivery, which is well known uh, in the US. Uh, so high growth of the drone logistic and transportation market with some legal implication concerns uh, regarding safety during travel and package, uh, because of course the, the drone is heavier and uh, lack of skilled and trained personnel. The second uh, experience that I wanted to mention you is the air taxi drone which is an experimental project launched by the managing company of the airport of Rome, uh, Roma Fiumicino. Um, it takes around 45 minutes driving car from the airport to the city, to the center city. Uh, they are now experimenting this uh, uh, transportation by drone, which would take just 15 minutes. Uh, of course, we they will need some time to fully implement this project, but they're working on it, and I confident that in a couple of years this would uh, become a reality. Let's go with the next slide, just to give you a short overview about the new legal framework. Um, it is a, a multi-level and complex field of you. EU law. You know that Italy, like the other European countries, are member of the uh, European Union, which uh, is a, it is not a federal state, I would say, because each each national state keeps its uh, autonomy and uh, independence. However, they, they, there has been a sort of assignment of uh, sovereignty to the European Union, which um, enacts a number of uh, directives and regulations which are mandatory for the uh, member states. Now, what has happened in the 2018 is the institution of the EASA, which is the European Aviation Safety Agency. Of course, the provisions laid down in the EU regulation are to be integrated with reference to further legal areas like public security law, privacy, data protection, criminal law, 
etc. Next slide, please. We have the EU legal framework uh, specifically related to drones because, uh, in our view, the current drone legislation is no longer sufficient to safeguard the innovative use of drones. We noted the attitude of the legislator to adapt and adjust the provisions or regulations related to aircraft and, uh, I mean, traditional aviation to the drones. And uh, we believe this, that this is not the right approach because there are uh, uh, specific uh, um, issues which relate to drones and that, that have uh, nothing to do or very few to do with uh, uh, traditional aircraft. So, next slide is uh, uh, a, a short, uh, let's say, uh, summarize uh, of the uh, main regulations in, uh, on drones. The, the first regulation that I would like to mention is uh, 1159 of 2018, which is called the basic resolution, a regulation which provides a mandate to the European Commission to adopt the legislation in relation to the operation of unbanded aircraft. Okay, so the Commission, the EU Commission, was instructed by the member states, by the Commission, by the Parliament, the European Parliament, to uh, regulate in detail the the drones uh, market and business. And this produces the two further regulations, uh, 945 2019 and 947 2019. The first one is related to the uh, certification of aircraft and the aircraft to be sold in the EU. The second one is related to operations. Let's go ahead with the slides. Uh, what the uh, do these regulations say? Well, they qualify the, the, the drones in three different categories. The first one is open, okay? It's, the, I would say, the, the, the lighter drones, maximum weight 25 kilos, some limitation related to the visual line of sight, which shall be below 120 meters. And that no pre approval is necessary to operate these uh, uh, drones. Then we have the second level specific drones where there is an increasing level of risk. And this means that the operator needs to make a specific operational risk assessment, SORA, unless the operation is covered by a standard scenario. And uh, before starting operation, the NAA has to issue an authorization. And the third level is the certified the category high risk as manned aircraft. We need the IASA certification, so a certification at an European level, not at the national level, of drone operator and remote pilots. Let's go ahead with the next uh, uh, slide. Of course, to each of these category belongs a different level of requirements and processes. For open category, the, the operator just need to register with the, uh, the NAA of the first EU country where the, 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 the operator wants to fly the drone. Important thing is that the registration with the NAA is valid in each of the EASA member states. So the operator the operator does not need to repeat the registration in each uh, country where he wants or to operate the drone. Then uh, there is a registration number which is issued by the NAA, which uh, identifies uh, the drones and is uh, displayed with a sticker on all the drones. It's a sort of plate and is uploaded into a remote identification system. And the operator needs to follow the drone regulations, which are specific to each member state. For the specific category, in addition to the requirements uh, that I mentioned that right now, uh, the operator must submit a declaration for a standard scenario or apply for an operational authorization to the NAA member state where is registered. Third condition, the level is the certified category. Uh, which applies to operation over large groups of people, transportation of humans, uh, 
precious goods which are transported. In that case, the unmanned aircraft shall always need to be certified. The operator will need an air operator approval issued by the competent authority, and the remote pilot is required to hold a pilot license. Uh, next slide uh, uh, is related to liability, which for uh, a lawyers, uh, <laughs> lawyers is a very sensitive problem. With this respect, uh, uh, while uh, we noted, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a high level of uh, sensitivity of this issue for drones, because it is uh, anyway an emerging an emerging technology. So, uh, uh, some degree of malfunction or failure is a characteristic of these uh, technologies. Uh, and in the absence of international conventions uh, related to the use of drones, uh, the, uh, the only legal ground for the liability system is found in the Rome Convention of 1952, which, as you know, is applicable to aircraft and to the uh, liability for uh, damages to third parties on surface. Um, national regulations uh, refer to the uh, EC Regulation 785-2004, which again is a regulation uh, related to insurance for air carriers and aircraft operators and not uh, specifically for drones. However, this regulation sets out uh, uh, some requirements for uh, an insurance coverage of the of the uh, aircraft and uh, and of, of drones. Next slide, please, uh, Jason. Uh, is always related to liability because uh, uh, now for uh, uh, operators of aircraft heavier than twenty kilos, uh, it is necessary to provide for. Uh, uh, insurance coverage, of course. We have uh, a minimum third party coverage, which is uh, linked to the size MTOM, MTOM of the any aircraft, including drones. The drones, you know, are in most cases uh, quite light, no? So the national states are now uh, mandating a third party insurance also in case uh, uh, a lighter drone is operated, so less than 20 kilos. This is the case of uh, Italy, where the local NAA has provided for uh, the open, uh, mandatory insurance coverage within the minimum thresholds established under Regulation 785, which is uh, around 1 million euro for a drone with MTOM less than 500 kilos. And the next slide is interesting because uh, it, re it is related to the uh, comparison that we have made. We have made a comparison of the insurance regime between drones and cars in Italy, because uh, in Italy, uh, the, 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 the driver of the car has to um, uh, over, uh, has to, um, I mean, uh, acquire an insurance coverage having some requirements for uh, uh, damages, covering damages to third parties. And you see uh, that for a, while for a drone having a, 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 an M, a MTOM less than 500, the minimum insurance, which here you find expressed in SDR, but it's around 1 million euro, something more, okay? While if you see on the other side of the slide, the, the, the minimum coverage for a small car in Italy is 7 million point uh, 300,000 euros. So you see there is a, a, there is no, no proportion between the two uh, liability and the insurance coverage mm. regimes. And uh, um, we can go to the next slide. You, you see uh, it's a, a small list of uh, some of accidents with occurred with respect to drones. I want to just uh, uh, mention the, 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 the what happened in December 2018 at Gatwick Airport, where um, drone sightings close to the runway caused the cancellation of 
1,000 flights, and uh, this involved around uh, 140,000 passengers. It, it was the biggest disruption at Gatwick since its closure following the 2010 volcano eruptions in Iceland, which are the main causes of uh, drone accident injuries and accidents. Lack of flight experience and knowledge, uh, drone manufacturing companies market drones as easy to operate when they are truly not, as flying a drone requires training, use of wrong drones by first-time users, there are cases where first-time users buy huge drones rather than starting with small ones and ignoring rules set by the NAA. Next slide is related to privacy and cybersecurity, which is one of the legal, uh, uh, most interesting legal issues. Uh, first, I would say that uh, for sure, the operation of a drone equipped with a camera and collecting a, a, a notable amount of uh, personal data during the flight uh, is covered for sure by the regulation, EU regulation on data protection, uh, which is the so-called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. And there is a strong attention of the EU member states on this issue um, because uh, the European Commission is trying also to help the operators to assist the drone industry in meeting the privacy and data protection obligations. And uh, we want to mention an extensive data protection impact assessment template for drone missions and a pre-flight checklist as a check for privacy and data protection questions. And in the second, in the, the next slide, we can see how uh, the privacy and cyber security issue can also be seen uh, in terms of possible uh, uh, drones becoming a target, a target of uh, uh, malicious software users seeking to steal data or be subject to hacking and hijacking in order to carry out other wrongful or illegal activities. And uh, interestingly, but also it is also a concern for the operators and uh, uh, the legal people uh, working on drones, we see that uh, only a uh, few uh, insurance policies cover the uh, issues of the invasion of privacy, data theft or hacking crimes. So I think that uh, we shall work on this issue as well because uh, I think that uh, privacy issues uh, related to drones will become in the next years a very uh, concerning point from a legal point of view. Then we uh, want to also to present to you, and this is the next slide, uh, what happens with respect to operations of restrictions. Uh, in Italy, we, uh, the ANAC, which is the Italian National Auto Aviation Authority, has uh, uh, specified which are the rules uh, to be followed for high space below 120 meters. And the, in, this slide, in this slide, you find uh, D-Flight. D-Flight is a company uh, belonging to ANAC, which is the Italian public company responsible responsible for management and control of the civil air traffic in Italy. And uh, the, 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 the purposes of uh, the flight uh, business and activity is the provision of uh, low altitude and traffic management services for APL, uh, remotely piloted aircraft, and all other types of, of aircraft which can be qualified as unmanned aerial vehicles, okay? And the, the system works around a geo-awareness service, okay, of digital maps, which allows the operator to understand what uh, it, it can be done or not, what is allowed or not in a specific area. And the next slide, you can find uh, uh, an example of uh, a map uh, provided by the flight, okay, where the operator can uh, see four different uh, zones or areas 
can you see the slide operations restrictions and the map which is divided in four zones uh, the basic zone is a blue zone where it is forbidden to fly drones in open category from an altitude of 60 meters then we have uh, the yellow zone um, the orange zone and the red zone the red zone is uh, uh, an area where uh, uh, the fly drones in open category cannot fly, okay? It's uh, prohibited uh, at all, uh, the operation of, uh, of a drone. And uh, this uh, this map is related to the city of Rome, and you will see that the, the red area are uh, basically the, the airport of Rome, should be, you know, the, 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 the port, and then the, the the city center where there is of course a, a high intensity of population however also in the in the, the zones where there are significant restrictions to operation these operations are allowed subject to a specific position from nna and the police okay and the risk analysis or a standard scenario okay so these are uh, this is an example of uh, how it uh, appears uh, a map in the flight system. Uh, but on the other, on the, uh, this is some, this is a challenge not only at the national level. We can go to the next slide, but also at an European level because uh, the challenges are, of course, ensuring the safe and secure integration of drones in the airspace, security and privacy, and the low altitudes in urban areas. So. The European Union launched this years ago a project uh, uh, named the U Space. U means you stay for uh, abundant, okay? And it's uh, the vision for an high traffic management system that would support safe, efficient, and secure access to European airspace for millions of drones. And uh, like in the US, you have the abundant traffic management initiative. New space consists of a coordinated effort uh, to enable the integration of drones into the low altitude air space. Uh, in the next slide, we have additional information about the new space uh, that the system uh, is uh, would be similar to the existing ATM for unmanned aircraft, which will be automated using tools like e identification and as a key component geofencing so that the information can always be accessed even by autonomous drones. Um, the, 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 the concept is that uh, the human touch in managing this system should be uh, I mean, reused to the minimum extent. Okay. And in the coming years, thanks to the networking between civil aviation authorities, military authorities, and other local authorities, it will be possible to set out specific services and procedures designed to ensure safe and efficient access to airspace for a large number of drones, and which are based on the high levels of digitalization and automation. Um, next slide, you find the, 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 the list of the uh, regulatory provisions for the institution of the new space and the policy package uh, regulating new space uh, uh, are, is applicable since 26 January 2023. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this package of uh, regulations is uh, already applicable in the, in the EU and the inter member states. How it works? How works uh, EU space? Next slide. Uh, there is a preparation of drones. Okay, so communication is sharing of information connected to AGM, navigation and communication coverage services, Flight planning assistance services and information services on the expected density of traffic in the mission area. Then we have as a second step a submission of a flight request and receipt of a, an acknowledgement by the NAA. Execution of the flight with a detect and avoid the system. And uh, then the mission is completed. So these are the four steps of the use space system 
some words at the end of this presentation uh, related to the urban air mobility, uh, which we expect becoming a reality in Europe within uh, two, four years. And this is the next slide, okay. Uh, in Italy and in Europe, uh, new technologies such as electric propulsion and enhanced battery capacity make this possible, urban air mobility. Um, we have several pilot projects uh, underway and some European manufacturers have already applied for certification, including for piloted vehicles for passenger transport. And while the first commercial operations are expected to be the delivery of goods by drones and transport of passengers, initially with a pilot on board. Um, next slide. Uh, we, uh, EASA has received a number of requests for the type certification of vertical takeoff and landing with all aircraft, which, as you know, differ from the conventional photograph of fixed wing aircraft. Um, there are some already some technical specifications which has to be uh, followed and developed by EASA. We call them special condition for all aircraft so that uh, each manufacturer knows what they has expect from them and what is necessary to ensure uh, certification and uh, their worthness standards uh, which is necessary for the issuance of a type certificate. Uh, the, uh, the agency is now in the process of creating new rules and revising, revising the existing ones to address new technologies, operational air transport concepts, flight crew and operator licensing requirements, with the objective to be agile and to adapt the regulatory framework to be in line with the performance-based regulations principles. So this is uh, uh, this, uh, this wanted to be uh, this was supposed to be an overview of uh, the uh, what what's going on on this side of the ocean with respect to the drones and boot all um, and but i mean if there is any question we would be very happy to to answer uh, any any query from the audience thank you alessia that was just absolutely it's always a pleasure to hear you and thank you for um thank you for your your, your work and attention to this um, we're going to try and see if I can get any questions. Uh, I know we have a question and answer. I don't see any questions. Um, let me. Uh, I, sent you, no. I sent you the slides. So yep. if you want to share that with, the, with the, 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 our colleagues, of course, you can do it. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I have the Q&A. We've already answered that one question from Mr. Stamper. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, I can also bring on the panelist again. Uh, sorry for that. Bring on screen. I'm going to bring you guys all back on here. Uh, unless you have some questions. Um, there we go here. Go, uh, Tim. So perhaps um, I can start off with a question. Sure. Oh, I have a uh, question for you here. Uh, uh, Tim, you can go ahead. Uh, oh, fair enough. Otherwise, I think we'll be jumping on each other. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the question I have is how the European Union uh, regulations proposed or enacted um, work alongside or not individual European um, regulations for instance how do the regulations in france or switzerland or germany work alongside the eu or does the eu take preeminence uh, yes good question uh, the, uh, the, 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 the intention of the easa and of the european uh, legislator is to uh, provide as much as possible a unique set of rules which would apply to each member state okay so this is this this is the intention it is not so easy because uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, social and political uh, issues and factors 
where I mean, some states want specifically to preserve their autonomy. No, they want to keep um, the possibility of uh, uh, issuing a, a regulation on this uh, on this on this uh, market on this sector. Okay, so uh, on the other side, I have also to say that. Uh, there are some uh, uh, local factors because, for instance, the, the orography of the territory, the geography is not the same, of course. No, and just to make an example, in Italy, we have uh, uh, our territory, we have a lot of mountains. Of, uh, I mean, so the, 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 there are some specific problems that we have in Italy with the operation of uh, rotorcrafts or drones, no? which are related to the, the while they, in Spain, they do not have exactly the same problem because it is only Germany, because the, the territory is flat. Okay. But I can make another example. In the Northern Europe countries, like in Sweden or in Finland, there, there is a number of uh, dark hours, which is uh, consistently higher than in Italy, no? Because uh, especially in the winter season or in the autumn season so it is not easy to coordinate the intention of the european legislator to uh, have the same rules applicable in, in all the countries uh, and uh, the resistance of the politicians of the national politicians and on the other side the fact that there are specific local issues which uh, um, suggest to to lead to the national authorities uh, uh, sufficient space of uh, autonomy in uh, providing rules. So this is the problem. With respect to the main rules related to drones, I can say that uh, a big effort has been made because the, the fact that the, the certification of the drones is uh, made by EASA and this means that if you are certified by EASA, then you can sell your drone in all the European countries. And this is good because, of course, it's uh, important that from a commercial point of view that, uh, of course, you don't need to repeat the certification process in all, in all, in all the countries. But uh, just uh, another example, I, when I was explaining the, 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 the drones categories open, specific and certified if you if you want to operate a drone under a specific category which is a, i would say the let's say the 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 increased risk uh, drones okay well you have to uh, uh, you can operate the specific category you have to register in the first EU account you country where you want to fly your drone but you don't have to uh, repeat the registration of your operations in the other countries. It is sufficient that you make it in your the first country where you want to operate. So, and this is good, of course, because uh, less uh, less papers, less filings, uh, and, uh, and 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 this is important. But uh, uh, I would say that this is a, a long process because, uh, in my view, as lawyer, this uh, this. Uh, specific area, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, an harmonization, uh, an increased harmonization of rules, because this would help the operators, this would help the business uh, for sure. Okay. Thank you, Alessio. Thank you. So I know Joe or Shihab have some questions. Uh, I can ask. Uh... Oh, one question uh, that I had. So in one of your slides, um, I saw um, some numbers um, related to minimum insurance amounts. Uh, I was just wondering um, how they came up with those specific numbers. Um, it's related to public property damage and personal injury. Oh, okay. Thank you for your question. I can say that uh, this is the seven seven eight five uh, uh, regulation, which provides for the, I mean, for the minimum insurance, 
is uh, the one related to aircraft. Okay, so and this means that uh, uh, the, 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 the legislator is basically using the same uh, uh, numbers, figures applicable to aircraft, and they are using the same figures for drones. And you and you understand that. Uh, I mean, in my view, it is not uh, a good choice because if the uh, amount of the insurance coverage is calculated over the MTOR, the kilos, okay, we, we know that the aircraft are pretty heavy while the drones are light. <laughs> and this means that, I mean, it doesn't make sense in my view that uh, the, 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 a drone with less than 500 kilos MTOM is insured just for 1 million. However, I want also to say that these are the minimum insurance coverage and that the operators tend to uh, increase the amount of this coverage. So these are just the, the minimum amounts. Thank you. Joe's got a question. Yeah. I, I I do uh, and fascinating uh, fascinating discussion. Um, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, one of the most proliferated use cases that we hear about in Europe is DHL's parcel copter. I'm kind of curious if uh, if you see use cases evolving uh, and what the public acceptance has been with those use cases uh, as they uh, as they move forward. Thank you. Listen, can you repeat, please, please? Because I, I couldn't hear okay. the, the question. Well, well, I'll put this up. Joe, do you mind just uh, it's about the DHL use case and public acceptance? Yeah, um, uh, the public acceptance of of drones. And then the extension of my question is, uh, how do you see the integration of EV toll aircraft, advanced air mobility aircraft, into the airspace system? And the use cases that you see most advantageous. Uh, the one that I have seen most used, for example, in Europe has been the DHL parcel copter, you know, off of, off of Jutland. And I'm just in, interested in public acceptance use cases. And then as that progresses to advanced air mobility, EV toll aircraft. Yes, I, I, I got the question. I, I agree with this concern because I mean, Maybe that we have been a little bit optimistic in saying that uh, urban air mobility could become a reality within two, four years. It may be that uh, it may uh, require more time. Uh, and for the reasons that you have just mentioned, because I see some problems, especially in terms of uh, uh, safety, uh, maybe also uh, noise. Okay, because uh, urban air mobility means that you have to fly over uh, high intensity population zones. And so the public acceptance, I agree, is one of the main problems that we, we may face and we are facing uh, uh, actually in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Europe. Uh, ju ju just to make a, a, an example, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I work a lot with the helicopters. I'm, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Italian Helicopters Association, which is the association gathering the uh, operator, helicopter operators uh, in the um, medical services, uh, firefighting, uh, and also transportation of passengers. And in Paris, uh, there was uh, a local urban uh, um, uh, area which was dedicated to the landing of, uh, of helicopters. And uh, due to the uh, contestations and protests of, uh, uh, of the residents, of the citizens, uh, they had to close that area. And then, so uh, it, this is a very good problem, a very good issue, <laughs> because I think that uh, it will not be easy to uh, have this uh, new system accepted by the, the, the population. Unless, uh, I mean, we will be able to, uh, let's say, to uh, demonstrate the big benefits which uh, 
this new system may bring to I mean, all the population or to most part of the population. Thank you. There's a couple questions, um, Alessio, online here, just to, to bring up uh, one of the questions I think is interesting. I, I want to ask you about who the manufacturers are that you've seen in Europe um, with a passenger carrying drones. But more importantly, there's a, the question is, has there been a progression uh, either in the U.S. or Europe to initially operate passenger carrying capable drones unoccupied or with just a pilot on board? I think that one problem will be also the acceptance by passengers of, of, of a new system where there is no pilot. I don't know if you if you agree with that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think that uh, transportation with drones or with people without pilots, uh, I believe, would be the, the last stage of this uh, long process. So uh, it will it will it will uh, uh, require, uh, I think. Uh, a, 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 a good number of years before having this uh, system accepted. We have some experience, but for instance, the, 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 the experiment that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, which is the Isle Taxi Drone, and the, made by the managing company of the airport of Rome, then it, 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 this drone is, uh, is uh, there is the pilot on board. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so they, they did this project, which is uh, still experimental with the pilot, not uh, with uh, without a pilot. Okay. So you're going to start it with the pilot, and this is what we've been talking about on this side of the border as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about unmanaged. There's another question on, on UTM, unmanned or uncrewed traffic management systems. Uh, the question I got, I know I can answer this. With drones operating in the national airspace system, will ADSB be required for those drones? The quick answer is it's prohibited here in the United States under Part 107 to have ADSB out. And this, I think, is paving the way for unmanned traffic management and that might clutter up with ADSB in out. ADSB in in I think is acceptable. It is acceptable because there's going to be sensors to avoid confliction of manned and unmanned air traffic. Have you seen anything on that aspect over in Europe? No, 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 no. not the same. No, okay. not, not in Europe. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand. And yeah, this Person's reminding me there's a little bit more to the question here. Getting back to the, the pilot on board. Um, this is a pilot on board. Are the testing of the routes going to be in sparsely populated area followed after months of safe operations by having them fly over more densely populated routes? And then when the public confidence is higher, starting carrying passengers for hire. Yes, I think that this is the this this would be the the proper uh, I mean way <laughs> to implement this uh, this uh, this kind of operations. Yeah, and steps so people gain the actual confidence, and that's yeah. exactly yeah, what we're yeah. exactly yeah. hearing in this part. Jason, uh, this is Joe. Could I add one question, one uh, one observation, sure. and that's with regards to. Uh, uh, to avoidance or non-conflict with uh, with crewed aircraft, there's 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 a cup probably a couple of cases of use of use operations where that might not necessarily be the case, and it may be the impetus for a different thought of integration. And and those two are uh, one search and rescue when we talk mm -hmm. about like Coast Guard operations and things like that. That may take priority. Certainly, the other piece is is like lifeguard, right? So let's if the operation is transporting, um, 
is transporting organs, which you know is is clearly the uh, the high priority traffic operation, then other aircraft will get out of the way of that drone operation. And with the point being that we often think that all drone operations have to be non-impactful to crude operations, to existing operations. And I get my point is there may be some, and that's just two examples, at least in my mind, where actually drone operations could take precedence over uh, all other existing operations. So a thought that there might be some pathways into uh, into that kind of integration. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Yes, let's see. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. I, I... Actually, it's more of a statement of of uh, just an observation. It wasn't necessarily a question. More of uh, how we're going to integrate um, with different exceptions. Okay, good. Um, also, to, I know we've got about two minutes left. Uh, unless there's any final comments from the panel or from Alessio. Um, I'd like to thank Alessio. And with all the technical challenges we've had, thank you so much for your for your. Uh, uh, yes, and and so certainly love to have you over here. And you know, I'll be hopefully back there shorter, uh, in shorter step. But I'd like to thank um, Marla Perez Davis from the AAM Center uh, and our panel. Um, uh, Joe Zeese, Dr. Shehab, uh, Tim Ravich. Uh, for 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 being on with us, and of course all of the uh, other members. I know there's a couple members who are supposed to be with us. Uh, and I know he's probably with us. Is is Gary Allen? Uh, he's retired from the Department of Justice. He used to be the head of the Admiralty Office, or so affectionately called. And I know this is going to Tim will get a chuckle out of this. The Crash and Splash uh, Office um, dealing with the Federal Towards Claims Act. And uh, of course, Chris Pazella weren't able to come on, uh, but I know they're with us here. So again, thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Alessio, and, and to your entire law firm for, for your assistance in this matter. And to all of you, thank you so much. And uh, uh, to our next event, which will probably be, um, probably be a continuing legal education for lawyers sometime in the new year, and we'll keep you posted on that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.